Welcome to the Capital News. I am your host, Alex Caritas. Today is Thursday, April 23rd, 2020. Thank you so much for joining me. The title of today's podcast is A Total Collapse. I might have to be reusing this title many, many times over because this is just the tip of the iceberg. So there might be a total collapse, part two, three, four, infinity and beyond. Might be a reused title. Be on the lookout for it. So we're going to talk about market performance. We're going to talk about initial claims. We're going to talk about the Federal Reserve's balance sheet today. Just a brief headline when it comes to the cash freight index. And then a couple interesting surveys that I stumbled upon that I'd like to share with the audience today. First, some of the market performance. I mean, these markets just don't care about the underlying data. They don't care. You have had PMIs come out. We talked last night about Japan and Australia. They were terrible. Markets don't care. European PMIs came out. Terrible. Horrendous. A total collapse across the board. Some of them in record territory, meaning they have eclipsed numbers that were seen in the depths of the great financial crisis and in the depths of the euro debt crisis back in 2012. That's not just for manufacturing. It is also service-related. Remember, services was supposed to be the saving grace. Yeah, manufacturing can take a hit, but you know that most of the world isn't all manufacturing base, especially the Western economy, so it's not that big of a deal. Everybody's a consumer economy. It's all about consumption, consumption, service, service. Well, now they've fallen. So now what? Now what's your excuse? What's the last leg you think we're standing on? Because it's no better here in the United States either. U.S. factory activity shrinks the most in 11 years. PMI fell to 36.9 in the month of April from 48.5 for the month of March and below market expectations of a reading of 38. This is U.S. factory activity, the lowest in 11 years, the great financial crisis. U.S. service sector contracts at record pace. U.S. services PMI fell to 27, 27 in the month of April, down from 39.8 in the month of March and below market expectations of 31 and a half. Not even close, folks. You understand the title? Total collapse. Then you take into consideration initial claims that came out today for the week ending, obviously, last week of April 18th. 4.4 million Americans have filed for unemployment. This takes the number to about 26.5 million Americans over the past five weeks applying for unemployment insurance. 26.5 million. Again, this doesn't count those who were already unemployed. And then we'll have to wait for next week to see what numbers come out from there. This also doesn't take into consideration the number of Americans who may be, may be on a payroll because they were, quote-unquote, saved from the bailout package, one of them from the federal government and or the Federal Reserve. But they're not working. They're on payroll, but they're not working. So that skews some of the numbers, too, that really paints the broader picture of who is working and who isn't. Right? Because there's unquestionably people who are on a payroll because of the bailout package or packages that aren't working. Okay. 26 and a half million. And as we've stated here many times before, unfortunately, over the past four weeks, all of those job losses have completely eclipsed all of the job gains over the past 10 years, since the end of the great financial crisis. In fact, a little bit longer than 10 years. What's going on here? Now it's most definitely worse, because now it's an additional 4.4 million on top of it. 26.5 million, and the number is going to continue. The number is going to continue. We haven't seen the full fallout in the energy space. We just haven't. The numbers just aren't there yet. At least not what one would expect, given this rapid decline and the price of oil and the price of natural gas, which has been sustained at these lower levels. Despite the saber rattling and the rhetoric heating up between the United States and Iran, once again, surprise, surprise, 
It makes no difference. It makes no difference. The only thing that will keep these oil prices up and sustain them is war. Let's hope that doesn't happen. But be on the lookout for it and don't be surprised if it happens. So 26 and a half million Americans unemployed over the past five weeks. This number will continue. Of course, it will, it's going to start to plateau. There's only so many jobs left. Uh, so we'll keep you posted on those as those numbers come out. Market performance. Well, you know, the markets were up just like they were last week, right? On our podcast, jobs down, stocks up. They don't care. The markets don't care. They just want liquidity from the Federal Reserve. They want more bailout stimulus packages, quote-unquote stimulus packages from the government. And, of course, Congress has now passed the $500 billion. It's actually $484 billion, but what's $16 billion? Let's just call it $500 billion in an additional round. I think this is Phase 3 because they're working on Phase 4, whatever that means, of another bailout package, perhaps for the states, as we discussed yesterday. Although Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell is now saying, I don't know about that. He can give trillions to his corporate buddies who finance his campaigns, but once it comes to the states, can't do it again. We're against all bailouts. But this just shows you how Washington works. Mitch McConnell is now all of a sudden concerned about future generations having to pay the bill. If it involves having to assist the states in some way. But corporations who squandered their resources? No, no, we don't worry about your grandchildren, your gen you now. We don't worry about you now. We don't worry about your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. Screw them. Don't worry about them for the corporations. But if you have to assist the states, God forbid, stop the presses. We got to get conservative again. We have to be fiscally conservative. This guy moves up to the top of my you-know-what list. I mean, this is ridiculous how these people behave. And people buy into it. Oh, yeah. I, yeah that's right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Take a stand, Mitch. That's right. It's about time. These people need their head examined. Trillions of dollars. This is a financial coup d'etat in your face. And nobody cares. And I have a very shocking survey that I came across that is just sickening, completely disgusting. And it tells you how dumbed down and stupid the people in this country truly are. You want to talk about total collapse? Wait till I read off these numbers. Unbelievable. Stocks were up until a headline came across from Gilead Sciences or something that was leaked out. Remember, this was the pharmaceutical company that had quote-unquote promising results of some early trials when it comes to some sort of therapy for COVID-19. Remember, we said you look a little bit longer in that presser, in that memo that came out, so said, well, we have to wait because this isn't final. There's a lot more we have to do. Markets didn't give a damn. They rallied on that news. Well, now you have another story coming out and saying, well, now the trials that are underway, not so good. Not so good. The markets were completely happy with another 4.4 million Americans being unemployed. Didn't care. But as soon as that headline came across the newswire, boom, the stock sold off. They were relatively flat for the day. The Russell 2000 was up about 1%. Right now in the futures markets, they're all down. Dow Jones, S&P, NASDAQ 100, all down about oh, 9 tenths of 1%. The Japanese markets are down 8 tenths of 1%. Across the pond in Europe, they were all up about 1% across the board. And right now, the Australian market is up about 4 tenths of 1%. On the commodity front, WTI is trading at $17.79. Quite the rebound, isn't it? Brent, the international metric, is trading at $22.50 a barrel. Natural gas, $1.82 per million British thermal units. Gold and silver right now as it trades, relatively flat. Gold is at $1,722 an ounce. Silver is at $15.17 an ounce. Uncle Sam's 10-year treasury note is now yielding 0.59%. Okay. So that's some of the market performance, some of the headlines. Wanted to throw those PMIs out there as they were making their way through the market. Again, completely shrugged off. You have to understand, in these PMIs are forward-looking indicators. All right? This isn't like an unemployment number. This isn't like a GDP figure, which already tells you what happened. Unemployment is a lagging figure. All right? Tells you where you've already been. Embedded within these PMI figures and these surveys, 
tells you what is likely to happen in the future as well. It ain't pretty. Markets don't care. Because evidently, once again, we remain in bad news is good news because that means more Federal Reserve printing, more ECB money printing, more Bank of Japan money printing. Pick your central bank, they're going to print more. Pick your federal government, they're going to spend more. Doesn't matter that they don't have it. The Federal Reserve, their central bank, will just pick up the difference. Which, of course, means you. You are the taxpayer. Governments don't have money, they take it. They don't make it, they take it from you. You don't have it. So where's it all coming from? The Tooth Fairy, the Easter Bunny, Santa Claus, where's it coming from? Coming from a printing press. Free was never so expensive. Check out that podcast. Free was never so expensive. Everybody thinks this is a gift. Wait till the piper comes to collect this one. Because there's only so many ways that a government can pay off its debts. Well, we're at 24, 24 and a half trillion in counting. All right. Two point three trillion dollar deficit as it stands today. Expected by the end of fiscal year 2020 that it will be three point eight trillion. I can almost assure you that it will be more than that, especially if we pass some sort of phase four bailout package for the states, for stimulus, for cities. What happens if there's a second wave of COVID-19? Or what happens if Donald Trump is wrong, which he is about pent up demand and the economy doesn't come roaring back? Then what? You're going to have to continue to throw more money at states to, for, so that they can fund their uninsurance, their unemployment insurance accounts. How much further is this going to go? A lot of unknowns. They don't care. Just print the money. Everything's free. Everything will work itself out. Governments can pay it back through growth. Well, there is none. We're heading into a depression. So scratch that off. And $24.5 trillion and counting, which is going to be closer. When the time this all settles, who knows? It's going to be close to 30 It's going to be close to $30 trillion in a couple years. All right? That's not going to be paid back with growth. All right? Because the growth, you can say, all right, we got a bigger tax base. People are making more money. We can tax it. We can pay off those debts. Ain't going to happen, Jack. So scratch that one off the list. You can default. You can default. That's not going to be a pretty picture. Social Security has a lot of those bonds. Other government agencies have a lot of those bonds. Pension funds have a lot of those bonds. Investment accounts, retirement accounts, other than pensions, have those bonds. Insurance companies have those bonds. Foreign governments have those bonds. They won't take too likely to default. So that's probably not going to happen as a straight-up default. Although it could, but there's going to be a lot of problems. Remember, one man's debt is another man's asset. Not good. Or you can inflate, which is what they're doing. But when you have a debt that is $24.5 trillion, by the time this dust settles, $30 trillion, maybe more, it's not inflation then, ladies and gentlemen. It's hyperinflation. It's a constant churning and turning of the printing press. You are the Weimar Republic in Germany. You are Argentina. You are Iran. You are Zimbabwe. You are Venezuela. I don't think many people want to go to those countries. Just be on the lookout for it. We're setting the stage for it. Because nobody can be a leader. Nobody can tell the American people or anybody else around the world the truth about the system, its faults, its problems, its issues, that it has failed, that this asinine criminal economic experiment that we have been on for the past decade didn't work. And now we're doubling down on it because that's what the Federal Reserve does. That's what other central banks do. That's what all governments do. They double down. Doesn't work. Try even harder with it. Definition of insanity. These are the people we call our leaders. You think the Democrats care about you? Get your head examined. You think the Republicans care about you? Get your head examined. Leave them. They have left you a long time ago. Leave them, please. Start some sort of peaceful revolution here. They will start to wake up when they see a whole bunch of people leaving the Democratic Party and the Republican Party and becoming libertarians, constitutionalists, independents. Mickey Mouse Club. 
Whatever you want. Make it up. Leave them, please. Do yourself and your country a favor. On the cash freight index front, down for the 16th consecutive month. Cash freight index down for the 16th consecutive month. Long, long before the onset of COVID-19. This is content. This is in agreement with the Dow theory again. The Dow transports. You want to get goods from point A to B. You count how much is moving from point A to B. Well, it's down. It's down big time. And consistently. 16 months. That removes some of your seasonality effects. 16 months to the downside. This was not a booming economy. Period. Stop. End of story. I don't know how many data points you need to see to believe this. I know I'm not on the air as much as Donald Trump is, and he just keeps saying it. He just keeps saying it. And if it's not him, it's one of his minions out there. They just keep saying it. And if you say it enough, it must be true. Well, it isn't. It wasn't. And it's not going to be. 16th consecutive month. Total collapse. Fed's balance sheet, right? It's Thursday. No delays this time, so I guess they got somebody who knows how to count this high. Another $200 billion added to the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, mainly buying U.S. Treasury bonds and mortgage-backed securities because nobody else wants them, especially U.S. Treasuries. They're junk. And had it not been again for the Federal Reserve buying them, yields would be through the roof. It would be junk. Believe me what I'm telling you. And if it gets out of control, that's what we're going to see. The Federal Reserve's balance sheet on the asset side now stands at $6.57 trillion. $6.57 trillion. You know, if the Federal Reserve continues on this pace of $200 billion a week, not a month, a week, you're going to have $10 trillion come next year. Just in what they've added to, right? What was their base? Their base was about $4 trillion. So you're going to have a Federal Reserve balance sheet if they keep this pace this time next year at $14 trillion. $14 trillion. Let's say we have a GDP of about $20 trillion, right? Just to make the numbers easy. 14 out of 20, what's that make it? Two in both, right? Seven tenths, that's 70%. 70% of U.S. GDP. That'll be the size of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet if it continues at this pace. If things get worse, what do you think is going to happen? Even if things get better. Remember, 2018? Oh, yeah, we're on autopilot. We're going to normalize our balance sheet. We're going to get back to some number. Maybe, you know, two and a half, two trillion. Maybe even one trillion if we're really lucky, if everything's really booming, everything's really cooking. Didn't happen. Rates got back up to, what, 2.5%? The economy couldn't take it. Well, then evidently we didn't have a strong economy. Couldn't even take it. 2.5%. And here we are on hyperdrive with a chart that is straight up. We showed this to you a couple of weeks ago in one of our capital economics presentations. We will be doing another one of these when it comes to the Fed's balance sheet just to provide updates as we continue through this insanity. If they couldn't normalize then, what makes you think they're going to normalize now? They're not. They're not going to. That's why the inevitable conclusion of this is hyperinflation, which is by definition is what they're doing now. But it's not a light switch. This is a big economy. It's a huge global economy. It takes time to make its way through the system. This isn't immediate. But we will see the effects of this, and it's not going to be pretty at all. Again, because there is no free lunch. That's why we titled that podcast, Free Was Never So Expensive. This is going to completely ruin the American way of life as to what people have grown accustomed to. Now, that quote-unquote American life was completely unsustainable, yet so many people have grown comfortable with it. That's what they're used to. We are creatures of habit. Doesn't matter if we were debt slaves or not. That's what we were used to. I mean, that type of stuff was even outlined in the Declaration of Independence about human nature and people growing accustomed to being slaved, enslaved. They don't care. They just get used to it. But then sometimes you got to stand up and you have a, have an uprising. And that was the heart of this country. 
That was the beginning of this idea that is America. It's been completely hijacked. We are in the midst of a financial coup d'etat, which is in your face, and nobody says anything because people are getting their $1,200 sit-down and shut-up money. And that's one of the surveys we're going to talk about. <clears throat> what they're <clears throat> excuse me, what they're going to do with that money. Some of it might surprise you. Some of it may not. Talk about the social and economic behaviors that are likely to ensue following any type of quote-unquote opening up of the economy. And then lastly, one of the worst graphs, worst surveys I have ever seen in my entire life in regards to the Federal Reserve. So that's it, folks. $6.57 trillion on the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. No end in sight. And again, most of this is just in U.S. Treasuries and mortgage-backed securities still. They really haven't started picking it up when it comes to all the other stuff that they're going to get involved with. And you can bet your sweet behind that they're going to. And you can also bet the farm that the federal government is going to put more stimulus, quote-unquote stimulus, out there for somebody. You already got the Secretary of the Treasury coming out and saying, oh, yeah, we're going to be working on something uh, for the energy companies. You know, because they didn't squander their resources either. None of this is anybody's fault. Yet I guess $1,200 is supposed to be the panacea for you. Trillions to Wall Street, trillions to corporate America. You get $1,200, sit down and shut up. Well, here's one of these surveys. This is from UBS, obviously one of the largest banks in the world, European. If you received a direct payout from the U.S. government from the stimulus bill, how would you spend it? Your options are savings, everyday expenses, pay down debt, home improvement, a category called other, a major purchase such as a TV, car, etc., a splurge purchase, and vacation. So again, the question, if you received a direct payout from the U.S. government from the stimulus bill, how would you spend it? Well, number one, coming in over 30% is savings. Wow, I'm impressed. I hope that's the case. I hope people can save the money. Number two, coming in slightly below 30% is everyday expenses. Well, that's no surprise, right? Everybody's got to live. Pay down debt came in at number three around 25%, and then everything else is below 10%, and actually most of it is around 5% or less. So you got, again, home improvement, other major purchase, splurge purchase, and a vacation coming in last. So if it's savings, let's just go through these one by one real quick, or the top three anyway. Savings, that's a good thing. That's a very good thing. It's part of the deleveraging process, right? That's how an economy balances out. Is that going to be good for GDP? No, it's not. Not in the short term. In the long term, it will because you're going to have people that actually have capital. You know this thing we call capitalism? Yeah, you're actually going to have some capital. You're actually going to have some money. Now, of course, this is coming from a printing press, so, you know, we can have that argument. But at least, at least people are going to start having a little bit of savings coming in. All right? That's a good thing overall. Short term, no, because GDP is going to take a hit. It was the almighty U.S. consumer that was supposed to be the last pillar that was supposed to keep it all up. Well, now nobody's working. That's the consumer. Bye-bye. See you later. Total collapse. Everyday expenses, got to live, makes sense. Pay down debt, you're the pass-through that we've been talking about here for weeks since all of this started. You're going to get the money. You're going to pay down your debt. Who owns the debt? Probably a bank, a financial institution, of course. And there you have it. You're just a middleman. Survey number two, this is out of CBS. Question, if stay-at-home restrictions were lifted, would you be comfortable going to a bar or restaurant? 29% said yes, 71% said no. Get on an airplane, 15% said yes, 85% said no. A large event. 13% said yes, 87% said no. This is staggering, right? Because this is all about the pent-up demand. This is all about everybody going back to normal. Ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen. Prepare yourself. There is a new, new normal going to happen, okay, for months. And if you get a second wave, forget about it. I mean, all of them. A bar, a restaurant, get on an airplane, a large event. I would presume that would mean a sporting event, a concert, those types of things. I mean, look. We knew this was going to happen. People aren't just going to jump back into the deep end of the pool. 
dip their toe in, maybe start at the shallow end, start swimming deeper and deeper if you like it, if you get comfortable. That's how people are going to behave. They have families. They have wives, they have husbands, they got children, they have older parents, they have people in their community that they care about, they don't want them getting sick. Okay? It's very simple. It's not rocket science, not brain surgery. This is human behavior. That's what economics is at the end of the day. It brings in a lot of disciplines, economics, math, statistics, sociology, psychology. It brings it all in. That's why you got to be able to connect the dots. That's why you got to look at all of these puzzle pieces, put them together, and paint the picture. That is what economics is at the heart. It's not all of these fancy models and mathematical equations. Uh-uh. It is human behavior. Now, of course, those models try to mimic or try to model for human behavior, but, you know, humans are pretty unpredictable in these types of events. But at the same time, there is predictability to them, which is why you have to understand the history, which is why you have to understand all of these other disciplines so you can put it all together. It's not just economics and their mathematical models. It's all of these other things with them. That's how you can paint the bigger broader, brighter picture. So you know what you're looking at and you know what's likely going to happen in the future. These are behavioral changes that are going to last for a very long time. People are saving money. At least that's what they say. I hope that's what they do. That is not good for short-term GDP figures. You have about a third, a third of major Freight liners, you know, that moves all of the goods, dry cargo. It's going to come to a halt. 30% decline. A 30% decline, basically, in world trade. You know how devastating that's going to be? This is just the tip of the iceberg. A total collapse. Now, the worst survey that I came across, which is just like throwing in the towel, unbelievable, in regards to the Federal Reserve, the question was asked, you know, people's approval of the Federal Reserve. It's like 60%. Hasn't been this high in years. 60%. Do you understand what this institution is? Who these people are? What they have done to you? This is like Stockholm Syndrome. Where you get that, uh, I think that's what it is, right? Stockholm Syndrome when you're kidnapped and you start to have some sort of emotional connection with your captors. That's what this is. The Federal Reserve has broken your legs and everybody's happy because the Federal Reserve says, oh, here, here's a pair of crutches. That's exactly what this is. I couldn't believe it. 60%. I guess that $1,200 is working. That sit down and shut up money. Talk about dumbed down. Talk about ignorant. And this is all by design. Whoever talks about the Federal Reserve, right? It's, oh, well, you know, it's, they're doing what they're doing. They're economists. They're hiding behind their fancy terminology and their fancy mathematical models. Don't worry about a thing. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. They're PhDs. They have access to whoever they want to ask questions, get data, get opinions. Don't worry about it. Just trust them. Just trust them. They've been beating you over the head since their inception, but really in overdrive for the past decade. And everybody seems to be happy with them. 60% are happy with them. I'd like to know who these people are. But I think we can take a good guess at who most of them are. Because it's the majority of people. You understand why we're in a lot of trouble? You understand why this is, a, this is the beginning of a total collapse? And we haven't even talked about today, well, of course, we've talked about it many times before, is the dollar's reserve status. The petrodollar system, is that in dire straits? Is that going to be one of the dominoes that falls in the coming months or years ahead? I believe it will be. The way in which America has worked and functioned and the way in which Americans have grown accustomed to is going to be completely different. And you have that convenient excuse that it was because of a pandemic, that it was because of COVID-19. It's not. COVID-19 was the pin that pricked the everything bubble. You can't have this much debt in a system. You can't have this many unfunded liabilities in a system. This is a Ponzi scheme. We talked about Bernie Madoff yesterday. 
Had it not been for the great financial crisis, Bernie Madoff would still be in business. Same thing with the government. The, our whole government is a Ponzi scheme. If we don't continue to increase the debt limit, the debt ceiling, well, then we default. It's found out that we're running a Ponzi scheme here because that's how they work. You want to pay your current, your new, your older investors, you need to get a new sucker. You need to get a new investor. Well, that's what the debt ceiling is when they increase the debt ceiling. You're trying to find new suckers so you can pay off the old suckers. So you can keep the Ponzi scheme going. That's how it works. You understand? It's very simple. You just have to be honest with yourself about the games that have been played. It's the perpetual kicking the can down the road. We are running out of road. States are broke. Laughably, they are asking a federal government that is also broke for assistance. Who do you have left? The printing press. The Federal Reserve which is an institution that is accountable to nobody in a system, in a government that is supposed to be supposed to be one of checks and balances. There is nobody who oversees them. Yeah, they go up to Congress every once in a while, ask their ass stupid questions, and they go home. Yeah, they give their press conferences. Stupid reporters, 90% of them, ask questions that are completely irrelevant. Never pressed, never followed up on, Never trying to corner the chairman of the Federal Reserve. Never. Isn't that what they're supposed to do? Ask the tough questions? Well, they don't do it. And as a result, you have the majority of the country thinking they're doing a good job. They're the, they are the disease. They're the cancer. And because you got one good side effect of it, what you think is a good side effect, you think they're your hero. Well... If you think that, I suggest you check out our podcast, Free Was Never So Expensive. So that's it, ladies and gentlemen, a total collapse, part one. We'll catch you here next time. Thank you so much for joining me. Please like, share, subscribe, get the word out, and leave your comments. We do love hearing from you. Stay diversified, stay vigilant, and stay with the Capital News. I am Alex Caritis. Godspeed.